We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online. And then we have in-person services on our campus at 9 and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Well, good morning. It's good to see you today. Like Bevan said, I'm Ethan and I'm the family pastor here. And this is my son, Richard. Um, I, I asked my wife, Richard's four, he's a great kid. I asked my wife if she could find a picture of Richard that really shows off kind of what a fun kid he is. And so I think this one nailed it. Uh, he's, he is a fun kid. He's also a master lizard hunter, as you can see. So he's, that's one of his new skills. He's a really fun kid, but like any other kid, he, uh, recently I noticed that he's been struggling with his attitude in different ways, um, just like all kids do. He's been struggling with his attitude. Uh, one thing that I realized, though, recently, a few weeks back, is that my wife and I, we've been talking to him a lot about his attitude, and it's kind of an ongoing conversation. If you're a parent, you, you understand that. Um, so we've had this ongoing conversation, but absent in that conversation has really been anything from God's Word, anything from the Bible related to that. And so when I realized that, I, I took Richard, we went outside, we kind of sat down where we could be alone, and we just we opened up to this Bible verse here, Philippians 2.14. It says, do, uh, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Real simple, straightforward. We had a conversation about it, and, and when I say we had a conversation about it, I mean that we talked about it for about 30 seconds, which was good. That was, that was I think, the, the right amount of time, and, uh, and he's actually remembered it since then, so it's been cool to see him uh, remember that conversation, remember God's word on that topic. And, and as a parent, I'm so glad that words like this, um, other words similar to it in the Bible, that, that God included those and, and gave those to us. They're, they're straightforward words. They're very plain. They're simple enough that my four-year-old can hear them and pretty much immediately understand what's going on and make sense of that. And then it really gives my wife and I this language that we can use with our kids uh, to, to not just talk about you know, the surface level stuff, but talk about what's God's perspective on, on what's going on. So I'm grateful for that. But one thing that's happened is since I went outside and read those words to Richard, I've been surprised and I've noticed that those words have been in the back of my mind too. And so I'm living life and all of a sudden I'll notice a little bit of grumbling in my own heart or I'll say something that's kind of complaining. And those words, they come back. The words that I share with my son, they come back, they circle around and they convict me. And this happens actually a lot. Uh, it, it amazes me how often the things that I am teaching my kids circle back around from God's word. They circle back around and they convict me. And then it works both ways because there's also plenty of times where I'll hear something from God's word, maybe in a message here at Seabreeze, or maybe I'm just reading my Bible in the morning. And, and the thing that God shows me, soon I'll have a chance to pass that on to my kids. And with a little bit of explanation, they get it. And it actually really, really helps them. And so the reason for that is that the Bible, it's not broken up by age group. There's not a, you know, a section for kids. It's not like Barnes and Noble with the kids section. There's not a section for kids, section for teens, young adults, um, and then everybody else. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Um, but it's true that we might be challenged in different ways. You know, depending on your age, you're going to be challenged in different ways, maybe by the same words from God. But God's word is relevant to all ages. So the same words that can challenge a 34-year-old, like me, can be explained in a way that, that challenge also a four-year-old, like Richard. And then words that are simple enough for my four-year-old to understand, well, those are words that at 34, I've, I've not outgrown those words yet, and I don't think that I will at, at 64 or at 94. And so what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to do two things. As Bevan mentioned, first, I want to give you an update on what's going on with the kids' ministry. So I want you to know, I want the whole church to know, to know what we're doing, how we're teaching God's words to the next generation. So I want to give you an update on the kids' ministry. And then what I want to do is spend the majority of our time looking at the topic that we're going to be teaching the elementary age kids this fall and looking at it and then talking about that same topic and, and asking how does it apply not to our kids or our grandkids, but how does that topic apply to us? So, so first of all, by way of update, 
uh, the most obvious thing going on in the kids' ministry right now is if you walk outside these doors, you see the construction of the new kids' building that's taking place right now. So that's exciting, and I really love this season of our church life where we're in the middle of this project, it's visible, you walk on campus, and you see it. And one thing I love about this is that I think it really represents something about what we value as a church. And actually, each of these projects, the, the new kids' building and then the basketball courts that go with it, they each kind of represent something unique about our heart as a church. So the new kids' building, this is the physical location where we're going to do much of our partnering with parents in order to help them raise godly kids. This is the physical place where that will take place. And this really represents our heart as a church to raise up a generation who knows God and who follows his word. But then we're not just concerned with helping parents who are already here at Seabreeze do that. We're also concerned with those who aren't here, with those, those uh, in our community who aren't a part of Seabreeze. And so the new basketball courts, this is where our upward basketball season takes place. If you've been around for a while, uh, if, if you're new, maybe you haven't seen one yet because we didn't have one last year. It's really exciting. We have hundreds and hundreds of families come and, and be on campus and participate in this. It's one of our, our biggest outreaches into the community that we do as a church. And uh, with the pace that the project is going, I'm really optimistic we'll be able to have a season this year. But this represents our heart for reaching families in our community who aren't a part of Seabreeze and reaching them specifically with the good news of Jesus. And so, so this is a project that we all have an interest in because we all have an interest in reaching families with the good news of Jesus, and we all have an interest in raising up a godly future generation. And so it's, it's fun to see it, really exciting to see it, taking shape. But as exciting as this project is, buildings and courts, they don't raise godly kids, right? People raise godly kids, and specifically, God's given parents the task of raising godly kids, and then the people of the church, we come alongside parents, and, and we help them in that effort. And so one of the major ways that we do that as a church is with our Sunday morning kids' classes. So right now, that's what's going on in the across the way, Sunday morning kids' classes. This is just an hour on Sundays, once a week, where kids can, they have fun, they build relationships, and they're able to learn from God's Word. <clears throat> so it's, it's kind of their version of what we're doing here, except they play more games. So you may wish that you were there. Um, we have no games this morning for us. I'm sorry. Um, but to make the most of this hour, a shift we're making, something we're going to do is we're going to begin in the fall uh, launching our own kids' curriculum that we'll have during this hour on Sunday, something that we've developed in-house. So I'm excited about that, and the theme that we're going to focus on this fall is Be Courageous. So that means that every Sunday throughout the fall, that's what the kids are going to be learning. While we're in here, they'll be over there learning about courage and what God's Word says about courage, how they can apply that to their lives. So that's kind of just a brief overview of what's going on with the kids' ministry. And so what I want to, want to, want to do now is just shift gears and take a look at that topic of courage with the rest of our time and ask, how do we take the same topic that applies to a six-year-old and, and an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old, and how do we apply that to ourselves? And so to do that, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at what courage is, we're going to look at what courage isn't, and then we're going to look at why courage matters. So first, what courage is. Uh, we tend to think that courage is kind of this autonomous power that we, we summon up on our own, this kind of autonomous human power that, that we have. But in the Bible, really any understanding of courage that doesn't factor in God, that comes up short. In the Bible, true courage is always rooted in faith. It's always rooted in faith in God, not faith in ourselves, our own abilities, or anything like that. And so when the Bible talks about courage, it means trusting God enough to step out on a limb and obey him even when it's hard. That's what the Bible means when it's talking about courage. And so for our purposes today, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of truncate that understanding, and we're just going to boil it down to this. Courage equals trust and obey. Courage equals trust and obey. That's, that's what we'll talk about this morning. So in the Bible, when God is calling someone to act with courage, he's really calling them to do these two things. He's calling them to trust him, and he is calling them to obey him. And obedience is required because God doesn't call people to just feel courageous. He calls people to be courageous by actually following instructions that he's giving them. And so God's call to courage is not a call to an emotion. Instead, it's a call to action. And so obedience is required for that. And trust is also required. And that's because if God is calling you to courage, then you can bet 
He's not calling you to do something easy. Uh, the call to courage, it's usually, it's usually accompanied with a call to obey something that is hard, something that's hard and difficult for us to do. And that involves stepping outside of what's comfortable to us and kind of going out on a limb and taking some kind of risk. And that's where trust comes into play. And so if God asked us only to do easy things, then we really wouldn't need to worry about this. We wouldn't need to trust him, and we wouldn't need courage. But courage is trusting God enough to step out on a limb and obey him even when it's hard. And a really, a really clear example of this in the Bible, kind of this trust-obey dynamic, is with the story of Joshua. Uh, the, the context for Joshua's story, it's in the Old Testament, and Moses, a generation before, he has, he's led God's people out of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt in some pretty miraculous ways, and they're going to this land that God has promised them. But then they fail to enter this land. They fail to enter it basically because they, they come up short in courage. Um, and so they, they fail to take this land, and so, um, so God, doesn't, God doesn't provide it to them. And then a generation later, Moses dies, kind of that whole generation dies, and then God gives them a second shot. This time Joshua is the leader of this second opportunity. But the problem is that the land is occupied by strong armies and strong walls. And these are the same strong armies and the same strong walls that caused the generation earlier to give in to, to fear and to, and to not have the courage to, to take that land. And so no one knew at this point how God was going to give the people this land. All they knew is that God had promised it to them. And so it's at this point that God comes to Joshua, and this is what he says. He says, be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. So here, we've got this charge from God to Joshua to be strong and be courageous. But then the charge, it's accompanied with this assignment. And the assignment is be strong and courageous because you will lead these people in to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. So in other words, he's saying, be strong, be courageous, because I have a job for you to do, a very specific assignment. And then he says a second time, be strong and courageous. He says, be strong and courageous this time, followed by be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So here, not only does Joshua need to be faithful to this assignment that God has given him, but he also needs to do it in a way that's obedient to God's words, the words that God gave him through Moses, where it says, be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. And the same is true for us. God, God has given each of us assignments and, and responsibilities within those assignments, whether it's work responsibilities, whether it's at home or at church. We all have that, and God expects us to be obedient by being faithful with the responsibilities that he's given us. But he's also given us his word. And so, as we're being faithful with those responsibilities, he expects us to do it in a way that is obedient to his word. But then, in Joshua, God says a second time, be strong and courageous. He doesn't just tell Joshua what to do. He tells Joshua where to place his trust this time. So he says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So this time the command is attached to this promise. And this promise is the Lord, will go, the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So God is telling Joshua here, yes, he is sending him out on a limb, but he's not sending him out on a limb alone. He's going out with him. And that's significant for Joshua. What that means for him is that he doesn't have to put his trust in himself, in his own ability, his own leadership. Instead, he needs to put his trust in God who is going with him. And this, this pattern is probably familiar to you, this pattern of, of call to courage, instruction to obey, and then reassurance of God's presence. This occurs throughout the Bible. It's, it's kind of a pattern as God calls people forward. So if you've read through the Bible or if you've read chunks of the Bible, probably something's come into mind where, where you've seen this show up before. But each time it happens, what it boils down to is God is telling people to trust him and to obey him. Uh, now every year on July 8th, my family and I, we celebrate Courage Day. And if you don't know what Courage Day is, that's because we made it up. 
and so I wouldn't expect you to uh, unless we talked. And so we made it up, though, because we want our kids, this, we think this is important. We think this idea is important. We want our kids to, to understand the importance of courage, especially when it comes to following God. So we made up a holiday. Um, and we chose July 8th every year because that's the anniversary of the first day that Andrea, my wife and I, that we met each other. Uh, we, and we actually met right back there. I don't know if you guys knew that. We met right back there nine years ago after a service here at Seabreeze. And uh, anyway, what that, what that has to do with courage is that I was uh, essentially terrified to meet her <laughs> on July 8th, nine years ago. I was terrified to meet her, but I also really wanted to meet her. And so, um, and so I had to kind of summon up some courage to go introduce myself to her. So we celebrate Courage Day on July 8th. And when we celebrate it, it's nothing fancy. Uh, what we do is we just have a meal, we have a fun dessert, we maybe have some kind of activity, uh, family event that we'll do. Um, but then what we, what we do after that, oh yeah, I forgot this. We, uh, we also tell the story of when Andrea and I met. That's another key component of Courage Day. And right now the kids love it, they think it's awesome. But I don't know how well that's going to age, uh, so we'll see <laughs> if they continue to love that as they, as they get older. But uh, after we tell that story, what we do is we pull out our, uh, our Courage Day journal. So this is it right here. And, and we just we go around and we reflect on the year and we think about things that, ways that people in our family, the kids or, or the parents, have, uh, have had to show courage, where we've had to trust God and we've had to obey Him. So there's there's everything in here from Richard killing spiders. Um, his sisters will be scared of spiders, and so they call Richard in, and he comes in with a rainbow sandal and you know, <laughs> kills the spider. So we like celebrating him uh, in that way. There's, there's everything from that. And then there's also in here just some, some really big decisions that Andrea and I have had to, to wrestle with and, uh, and, and have been a, a, a pretty big deal. But, but the point of it, the reason we do that is to, to highlight kind of the real life ways, both for us and for our kids, that, that courage has required trusting God and obeying him. And so, so what we've done this morning is we've kind of boiled down courage to these two components of, of trust and obey. And what this does is it provides us with these two dichotomies. The first one is uh, this obey versus disobey dichotomy. And then the other is stepping out on a limb versus remaining inside of our comfort zones. And so at the intersection here of obey and stepping out on a limb, well, that's where we find our, our biblical understanding of what courage is. But then these categories, they, they not only help us understand what courage is, they also provide us with these three empty boxes that help us kind of fill out our understanding of what courage is not. And so we'll jump to what courage isn't. In box number two, we have kind of this intersection of of out on a limb, but paired with disobedience. And so in other words, this is where we have risk, but without regard for God's will. And what we call this is, this is careless. This is being careless. And carelessness is really a common courage counterfeit. And if you spend much time on YouTube, just kind of browsing around, well, this is what you're gonna find. You're gonna soak in this version of courage that really glorifies risk, but has no place for God. And uh, here is an example that I found, and I'd like to apologize in advance if you are afraid of heights. So what's wrong with this picture of courage? <laughs> it would actually be really easy for us to just kind of call this stupid and then forget about it and, and move on. But what's, what's actually at the heart of carelessness is carelessness with our responsibilities. That's really what's going on. And so you don't have to do a handstand on a skyscraper in order to find yourself in this category. We actually find ourselves in this category quite a bit. Um, it, it, instead, this, this category really shows up as we play games with the responsibilities that God has given us. And so back in Joshua, when we were looking at that, the word for be strong that was used, that carries the idea of having a firm grip, having a firm grip on your responsibilities. 
And so you can't have courage without having a firm grip on your responsibilities and without taking them seriously. And when we take risks that are outside of God's will, what we're doing is we're being flippant with our responsibilities that God has given us. And so, so if you're taking a risk, you really want to nail down, you really want to know, is this a risk that is in God's will or is it not? Uh, now, Andrea and I mentioned we met nine years ago. Uh, we got married eight years ago, and, and, but just before our first anniversary, we, our first daughter was born. And so when that happened, that whole year kind of newly married and expecting this baby on the way, man, I just really remember feeling pressure like I'd never felt it before, kind of this new weight, this new pressure of the responsibilities that God had put on my plate. And it was also around the same time that the idea of getting life insurance first came onto my radar. As a single guy, I really wasn't sure who my beneficiary would be, and so it didn't make a lot of sense. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, this is, this is important. I need to think about this. But the problem was that babies are expensive, and uh, on top of that, our cash flow was pretty tight. And even though life insurance policies for non-smokers in their 20s, they're not very expensive, man, it felt like a lot of money. It was like 30 bucks a month. It felt like a lot of money to me at the time. And I had all, all kinds of other plans for what I could do with 30 bucks a month in that life stage. So my first instinct was just kind of pocket the 30 bucks and take an approach of, you know, everything is going to work out fine. Everything will be okay. And just kind of bet that nothing would happen and that that decision would never be regretted. But then the more I thought about it, the more I became convinced that what I was actually doing was playing games with the responsibility that God had given me for essentially selfish reasons. And so it became clear that it was, that was outside of God's will for how he wanted me to use my money, provide for my family, and just handle the responsibilities that he'd given me. So what I ended up doing was taking that $30, the precious $30 a month, and getting a life insurance policy and doing what it really seemed clear that God, God was leading me to do. And that's, that's a pretty small example, but as we get a firm grip on our responsibilities, we begin to, when we begin to trust God, we begin to obey God with these $30 a month size decisions, then what happens is God uses those experiences to grow our faith and help us trust him in bigger and bigger ways. So that's kind of the first category there. The, the, the next one is, um, well, it shows us that not everything that God asks us to do involves stepping out on a limb. Uh, in box three, we have this intersection of obeying God, but still actually remaining in our comfort zone. And when this happens, we call that convenient. It's convenient. It's not courage, but it is kind of convenient. And so when something's convenient, it doesn't require much effort. It doesn't, it doesn't, require, much, um, doesn't, re doesn't require much risk, and it really doesn't interfere with our comfort in any way. So it's convenient. And there's some things that God wants us to do that fall within this category. And that's not a bad thing. It's actually not a rare thing. Uh, this happens all the time. This is a category that we actually live a lot of our life and, and we experience a lot. So if you've been coming to Seabreeze for a while, and maybe you've, you've got friends here that you enjoy coming to see on Sundays, you enjoy getting coffee and donuts, well, that's a great thing. God wants you to do that. Now, if you enjoy nature, if you enjoy spending time in God's creation, that's great. God wants you to do that. If you enjoy playing with your grandkids, then that's great. God wants you to do that. And if you enjoy kissing your wife, well, that's great. God definitely wants you to do that. So there's, there's nothing wrong with being in our comfort zone. That's not a bad thing. The problem comes when we begin to think that we can build a life. I'm sorry, I just saw a couple kiss, and I couldn't hold it together. That's great. <laughs> uh, the problem with this comes when we begin to think that we can build our life, that we can build our life and only live exclusively kind of in this box number three. And often we live as though our goal is to build kind of this resort style life where we never have to worry about trusting God. But the reality is that just, that's not how life works. It's only a matter of time before God invites us to step out on another limb. And when God invites us to step out on another limb, at that point, we have to choose. Are we going to move up? Are we going to move up into that courage category? Or are we going to move across? Are we going to choose ease and kind of move across into this fourth category, one that we haven't talked about yet? And in this fourth box, this is where we stay in our comfort zone, but we do so at the expense 
of disobeying God. And we call this category, or this category is cowardice. And cowardice, this is, a, this is kind of an ugly word, but I think it's appropriate to describe what happens when we know what God wants us to do, and then we choose to not do it because either the, the price is too high, or we decide, you know what, that's just too much risk. And the irony is that we move into this box in the first place because we want things to be comfortable and we want things to be safe. But then it turns out that being in this box is actually miserable and it's actually a really dangerous place to be. It's miserable because we're opposing God. And when we oppose God, that hinders our relationship with God. And it's dangerous because it takes us and we step out from underneath God's protection. We step out from underneath what God is blessing. So we think it's going to be safe, it's going to be comfortable. Turns out it's miserable and it's dangerous. And there, there are countless ways that we do this, lots of ways that we can step into this category. When I think about myself and times when, when I've kind of played the coward and stepped into this category, one of the first things that comes to mind is with uh, asking people for forgiveness. A few times in particular come to mind where I know that I've wronged somebody, I know from God's word that he wants me to ask their forgiveness and clear up that relationship, but I've decided, you know what, that's just a limb that I'm not willing to step out on at this time. And every time that I've done this, whether oppose God in that way or, or in another way, man, I've experienced, it is miserable. It's miserable to be in this spot. And there are many ways that we oppose God to stay in our comfort zone. So here, here's some examples. If God is asking you to be generous, well, you might stay in your comfort zone instead by being stingy. Or if God is asking you to confess sin to someone, Bevan talked about this last week as a part of his message, if God is asking you to confess sin in your life to, to someone, then you might stay in your comfort zone by just kind of keeping that secret, keeping it in the dark, covering it up. If God's asking you to ask a girl out on a date, well, you might stay in your comfort zone by avoiding the girl. If God's asking you to break up with a boyfriend, well, you might stay in your comfort zone by just kind of going with the flow in the relationship. If God's asking you to enforce a decision that you know is going to upset your kids, that's, that's going to be a challenge with your kids, well, you might stay in your comfort zone by just kind of appeasing your kids and not enforcing what it seems like God wants you to enforce in your family. Obeying, and, obeying God in these areas, it's difficult, but what happens is that as we step out in courage, we find ourselves closer to God for having trusted him. And then we find that his hand of blessing is on us, and that he is protecting us, and he's blessing us in ways that are often unexpected. So that's what courage is not, why courage matters. Courage matters because this is how we grow in Christ. In fact, this is walking with God in a nutshell, this kind of pattern where we, we step out on a limb to obey God, we see him come through, and that grows our faith. And then we do it again. He challenges us in another way. We step out on a limb, we experience him coming through, and that grows our faith, and that repeats itself. And Jesus' final words to his disciples, he kind of gives us this picture of what this can look like. He says in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven, on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the decision to become a disciple or a follower of Jesus, the decision to become a disciple in the first place, well, this is stepping out on a limb. Every person in all of history who has decided to become a disciple of Jesus, it's required of them that they put their trust in Jesus to make them right with God and trust in nothing else to be right with God. It's required taking the reins of, of their life out of their hands and putting it in God's hand. That requires a lot of trust. And then once you become a follower of Christ, the next thing he says, as he begins to grow your faith, the next thing he says is to be baptized. Baptized. To be baptized, this is to publicly associate yourself with Christ and basically announce to the world that you're serious about following him. And for some, especially those who have family who think it's just crazy to follow Jesus, for some, this is a huge act of trust. So the decision to follow Christ, the decision to be baptized, that's actually just the beginning. The next thing that Jesus says is teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And that's a lot. As we, as we walk with God, though, as we read his word, he begins to bring these things to the forefront 
and bring, the command, bring commands to the forefront that we can interact with. And as that happens, we find that many of those commands involve stepping out on a limb and trusting him. A great example of this is the command at the very beginning of these verses, the command to make disciples of all nations. So if we're going to obey all the commands of Jesus, well, certainly it includes the command that he just gave, the command to make disciples. So in other words, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to tell other people about Jesus and invite them to respond to him. And in my experience, I have found that there is almost no way to share the good news of Jesus with someone else and invite them to respond to him while staying inside of my comfort zone. There's almost no way I can think of no times that that, that, has, that that has happened to me. Sometimes they're easier than others, but really obeying this command, it almost always involves stepping out on a limb and trusting God. But when, when I've done that, I'll tell you, that is one of the times when I have seen God show up the most, when I've been the most amazed by what he's doing, when I step out on that limb to tell others about Jesus. But as we step out, as we obey this command, as we obey the other commands, what we're doing is we're building this collection of experiences over time of seeing God show up and do amazing things, and that grows our faith. And this is possible because just as God didn't send Joshua out alone, so also Jesus hasn't sent us out alone. These are the very final words that he said on earth. He said, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So he's saying, I am here, I am with you and you can trust me. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to wrap up just kind of on a note for for parents, uh, circle back to that. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're going to, this is what we're going to be teaching on Sunday mornings in the kids' classes as we kind of launch this new curriculum throughout the fall. It's going to take on a different flavor to be sure as we teach it to kids as opposed to talking about it in here this morning, but the truth of God's word behind it remains the same. Uh, And the reason we're starting off with the topic of courage is is that the goal of parenting is to raise godly kids. And one of the main ways that we raise godly kids is by helping them develop this robust collection of experiences where, where they've actually gone out on a limb themselves to trust God and seen him come through for them. And so, so building their courage in this sense is really building their faith. So that's why we're starting out here as we launch this new kids curriculum. Um, And so if you are a parent of elementary age kids, then I want to invite you to a meeting coming up two weeks from today. Uh, Also included in this meeting are all those who are leading in the kids' ministry, who are part of leading in the elementary classes over there. Uh, In the meeting, we'll just go into some more detail about what we'll be talking about with the kids, how we'll be teaching this to them in the fall, and how we can partner together to help them get the most out of what's going on there. There's going to be two meeting times. Uh, one during each of the services, the, the 9 a.m. and the 10.30 service. They'll, they'll both be in the warehouse. The, the junior high students, they're going to make some room for us. They'll be in the big room on that particular day. So, um, so it's going to be over there. There's two meetings. And you can come to the one that makes the most sense for you. And I also want to let you know it is totally fine if you leave your kid in, uh, in both services, in their class for both services. We're totally fine with that so that you can attend both that meeting next week and then also be a part of attending the worship service. With that, let's pray. God, we thank you that you have made your word um, accessible to us, and um, there are things we don't understand in it, but God, um, it can apply to children, it can apply to adults, and, uh, and God, it is, it is so helpful for guiding our lives. Uh, as we do work to, to get to know your word, you reveal to us, you meet us where, we, where you're at, and, and your word is, is sufficient to help us and to, to guide us, God. Um, I pray that that you would help us to take advantage of having your words and having access to your words, God. I pray that we would uh, neither be careless nor cowards, but that you would help us to act with courage, God. And I pray that you would help us to pass that on to the next generation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.